Hi, my name is Paul and I'm a member with Restored Church. If you're new, we want to welcome you and thank you for tuning in. We believe that the church is not an event, but a family that you belong to, so we'd love the opportunity to connect with you. If you want to learn more about our church or if we can help you in any way, please visit our website, restoredtemecula.church, and click on Contact. We also have a mobile app with resources, including our Sunday messages, information about upcoming events, and other ways to connect. You can download our app on Apple or Android app stores. With all that said, we hope you enjoy the message. Everywhere. All right, guys, good morning. My name is Herrick. I'm one of the pastors here of Restored Church, and I want to welcome you to our gathering. Uh, we are going to... We're going to pause this week on uh, the series that we've been in. We've been, if you're new, we've been in a series called The King and His Kingdom. We've been going through the Gospel of Matthew, and we have been working through the Sermon on the Mount for a while. And we have a while to go, um, which is really good because we're just taking it real slow and just meditating and chewing on Jesus' words for us. And we're, we're going to pause today. Um, I really felt like this week, I'm trying to be really open-handed with this time, with the opportunities that I get, and so I'm praying, like, God, what, what would you have me preach on? What do you want, uh, what, do you, what are you doing? And how can, I, how can I align what I'm preaching on with what you're up to? And so this week, I really felt uh, prompted to pause on the King and His Kingdom and to actually go back into the Psalms. And if you were here during the summer, we did a summer in the Psalms. We, we spent weeks and weeks just slowly going through the Psalms. Uh, it's kind of like the ancient uh, prayer book, it's a song book, it's an amazing, rich piece of literature that the people of God have been using for generations to strengthen them, ourselves and encourage ourselves. And so we're going to go back into the Psalms today. I feel like Psalm 6 was just clearly on my heart this whole week. So if you'll join me, please pray uh, with me for this time that God would open our hearts to receive what he has. Uh, Father, thank you. Thank you for this morning. Thanks for an opportunity to gather as your people. Thank you for this opportunity to slow down and to hear from you. I pray that you would help me this morning to really follow you and for each of us to follow you. Ultimately, each of us are cultivating a life with you. That's the goal. Cultivating a relationship with you. Cultivating a life of dependence on you, learning from you, enjoying you, obeying you, operating like you. This is discipleship. It's becoming like your son. It's following him. And would this morning be a morning where we experience you, where we encounter you, where we delight ourselves in you? And would you help me? Would you give me all that I need, and would you give us all that we need in order to connect with you and engage with you and really respond? The goal of this is response. It's not to entertain, it's to respond to the king who's worthy. God, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Uh, I am a Lord of the Rings fan. Uh, I think, is there any others in this room? Okay, well, about a third of the room, great. Where are the Lord of the Rings haters? <laughs> yep, okay. Anybody just kind of completely like, I don't know what Lord of the Rings are, I'm, I'm kind of indifferent. Okay, Lisa, great. All right, so Lord of the Rings. It's not for everyone, but it kind of is. At least today, because I have a mic and you don't. <laughs> so here we are. So the Lord of the Rings. It's actually an Adam Sandler quote <clears throat> from Wedding Singer. Lord of the Rings is this incredible story. J.R.R. R. Tolkien wrote it. Uh, he, was a, he was a buddy of C.S. Lewis. Some of the greatest minds of the last hundred years have provided uh, pieces of literature that can in endlessly engage the mind and the heart. And both of those men were actually deeply influenced by the story of the Bible, by the scriptures. So I'm constantly thinking as I'm li listening to, you know, sometimes I'll listen to Lord of the Rings, I'll watch, I'll read, whatever. I'm constantly thinking, reminded of the story of scripture. And uh, there's actually a brand new, I guess it's probably two or, two or three months old at this point, so not brand new, but there's a new series that Prime has put out. Has anybody watched it? Yep. Okay, so a few of you guys have. It's The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. It's actually, I think it's like the first billion dollar series, like television series, like billion with a B. Um, so it's, it's epic, it's grand. And the, I'm gonna, I don't think there's gonna be any spoilers here because I think everything that I say is like within the first five minutes of the first episode, so whatever. 
I don't think it's going to spoil anything for anybody. But, um, but when the first episode of this new series starts, it starts with uh, this elf, Galadriel. And don't think like Buddy the Elf, like washing down spaghettis, spaghetti with maple syrup. This is like, think more of like an angel. It's like an, she's like an angelic uh, being, essentially. In, this wor- in the world of the Lord of the Rings, there's all different kinds of beings. There's orcs and hobbits and elves and dwarves and people. She is of the elven kind, essentially. And I can already see some of you. Some of you love this. Some of you are like, what in the world did I, why did I come to this? Um, she's an elf. And uh, she's sitting, uh, she's, she's putting this little paper boat uh, down into a stream, and it starts to sail, and she's really excited about it, and then these other little elves, she's a child, these other little elves come and start throwing rocks at it, and they sink it. And she gets pretty upset, she gets mad. And so she's, um, she's actually about to deck one of the other elves uh, when her brother like, kind of pauses her and stops her. He has an older brother. And they, the, the scene shifts, and they go, and they're under a tree. And they're talking, and they're discussing what happened. And so I'm going to quote, I'm going to read a, kind of a, a bit of a quote from one of the nerdiest websites I've ever been on, the Tolkien Gateway. <laughs> Whatever. This is where I hang, and you're hanging here too today. <laughs> so uh, in this memory... There's some elven children that had bullied her and sank her paper swan ship, and she tried to attack one of them, which is a fairly natural reaction. You hurt me, I hurt you. And usually, like, I'll hurt you enough so that you won't do it again type of thing. That's what she was going to do. But her brother showed up. Her brother's a little older, a little wiser, and loves his little sister, and he showed up just in time to prevent her from doing any harm. And so... Not long after, they go and they're, they're hanging out underneath this tree talking. And there is, think like a garden with a tree, sitting down underneath it, talking with a wise person. And she's explaining what happened, and her brother asked her, hey, do you know why ships float while stones cannot? Do you know why ships float while stones cannot? And she doesn't. And he tells her, stones look downward toward the irresistible darkness of water, while ships look upward towards the fixed lights that guide her. And the ships fight against the darkness of water. And so Galadriel, though, she's, she's like, okay, this is deep. It's early in the morning. Like, I'm six. This is a lot for me to take in. But she's, but she's like trying to take this in, because obviously it's not just about boats and stones. There's something deeper going on here. She questions her brother, Finrod, which is a great name. If you're having a child soon, I highly encourage you to consider Finrod. You can go Finn or Rod. So she questions her brother who says, or she says, hey, the stars, the stars above, you're telling me to look at the stars, to follow the light. But don't you know that the stars above, they shine just as brightly in the water? And sometimes they shine so brightly in the water that it's hard to know which light to follow, which is to say it's hard to know which way is up and which way is down, which is deep. This is like 90 seconds into this episode. You're all welcome. We'll be watching tonight. <laughs> what's, a, what's going on here? I think there are moments in life of just profound disorientation where we don't know which way is up and which way is down. There's challenging circumstances that we face. Uh, we experience hurt. Sometimes it's, it's small things, like somebody sunk my paper boat, and I'm mad. Um, but it speaks to deeper things sometimes. I feel overlooked. I feel unimportant. I feel hurt. I feel upset. I feel overwhelmed with anger. We've all experienced this sort of thing before. And my initial reaction actually isn't the right one. Anybody been there before? Just defaulting to what we know and what's natural and what seems right often leads us astray. And we experience all kinds of pressures. I just wrote down a few that I know are present in the room right now. We experience challenging circumstances like sickness. We experience challenging situations like relational pressure, relational fractures in our families, in our workplaces, uh, in our friendships. Uh, Sometimes we experience uh, financial pressure, I think, 
A lot of us have experienced that just over the last couple of years especially. Sometimes we experience depression, loneliness, anxiety, all those things. Uh, sometimes we are just thirsty for people to approve of us. Someone, sometimes we just want somebody to notice us and like us. Uh, sometimes, and this is I think one of the be- biggest challenges that we face in our day, is just that we're so busy that we cannot cultivate a life with God, a spiritual life with God. Sometimes we experience rejection. All these things, what's my point in saying this? Our world is complicated. Our world is messy. And sometimes we don't know which way is up and which way is down. We don't necessarily know how to get through things well. And our initial responses let us down. The way that we've learned to handle things doesn't work. Sometimes we just want to process life. Oftentimes we process life from within our own resources, just what we know. Just what we know. What we learn in our upbringing, in our families, in our culture. Sometimes there's other influences. Uh, sometimes when we have our upbringing, our families, the family baggage that we carry, when we have the culture that's loud and chaotic shaping us and other influences, and they combine with challenges that we face, pressure, and we just look around for options that are available to us, we identify a path through messiness, through pain, through brokenness, and it feels right. It feels right. It's like, yes, this is the way through. Sometimes it's a conscious choice. A lot of times it's just purely a reaction to circumstances. Sometimes we just want to eliminate a threat that's in front of us. Sometimes we just want to protect ourselves. Sometimes we just don't want to feel alone. Sometimes we just want the pain to end. Sometimes we just want to feel loved. Sometimes we want to distract ourselves. And there is a way that seems right to us. A path that seems right to a person, but the end of it is death. That's Proverbs 14, 12. Sometimes the things that promise life to us and light, that look like light, actually plunge us in the darkness. Sometimes what promises to be life-giving and that looks like light, like we're following the path, is actually a reflection that plunges into darkness. Sometimes the things that draw us in are more like bug zappers, If you've ever been around a place where there's just lots of bugs, you turn on one of those bug zappers, what happens? Yep. Yep. Uh, UV light that pulls you in before it kills you, basically, which is really intense. We don't think much of it because they're bugs. We don't really care that much about bugs. But can you imagine for a moment if life is full of kind of the human equivalent of bug zappers, these false sources of of freedom, of joy, of life that are actually death? that are trying to plunge us into death. When you read the Bible, when you open the pages of scripture, there is a reality that God created the world. And you find humans with God where? You guys can actually answer that. (laughs) Where do we see humans with God? In the garden. And where do they hang out? What's up? What's in the garden? Trees. And what was the life of a human with God in the garden? It was perfect. What were they doing? They were walking with God. They were talking with him. They were learning the way. They were learning wisdom. They were learning how to do life. How to not process life from within their own resources, but receive everything from God. There was a way that seemed right to a person, but its end is death. That did not exist in the garden. There was only one way. It was life with God. Gladriel, when she's sitting there with her brother, she's processing life. She's trying to make sense of it, which is something that we do every single day. Every day of our entire lives, we're trying to process life. We're trying to process life in a way that makes sense to us. And what we need more than anything else, we don't need our own wisdom. We don't need to figure things out on our own. We don't actually, we don't need, we don't need to feel confident that we know what to do. We don't actually need to feel like, I got this. What we actually need more than anything else is to recognize, I don't got this. And I need him. Him. 
I want to invite you guys to turn over with me to Psalm 6. There is a way that leads, that seems right to a person, and its end is the way of death. But there's also a way that feels wrong to us that leads to life. There's also a way through the pain and the hard stuff of life that seems wrong to us that leads to life. And we're going to catch up here with David, who is facing a situation. We don't actually know the exact situation that he was facing. This is on purpose. The Psalms oftentimes don't tell us exactly what's happening, although sometimes it does. Sometimes the Psalms do. The Psalms are a collection of 150. There, there's 150, there's poems, there's songs. There's, it's a beautiful collection. It's rich. Sometimes we get all the all the info that we need to understand what's happening and what the situation that David or whoever's writing the psalm is facing that causes them to write the psalm, sometimes we don't. And this is one of those psalms when we don't exactly know what happened to David, but we do know that he's under pressure. We do know that he's struggling. We do know that he's facing something that's sort of like a dark night of the soul. He's, he's in trouble, and he knows it. And so the reason I think Psalm 6 is so important for us today, it's going to teach us what it looks like to not respond to life's problems and pressures from within our own resources, but to actually look elsewhere. It's, it's sort of like when we're low, this is going to teach us how it is that we look up and actually see the light in the midst of our problems, in the midst of our pain. A light that we can count on to guide us through the darkness. So Psalm 6, if you have your Bible, uh, you can go there. And if not, it should be up here on the screen. Psalm 6. This is, in my, in my uh, CSB, it says a prayer for mercy. And it says, for the choir director with stringed instruments, according to Sheminith, which is a fun word. Uh, Sheminith, which has to do with the number eight. It's, it might refer actually like an eight-stringed instrument. Uh, we're not completely sure, but that's a good guess. This is a psalm of David. In verse one, Psalm six, verse one says this. It says, Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger. Do not discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are shaking. My whole being is shaken with terror. And you, Lord, how long? So obviously David's in a bad place. This is a dark night of the soul for him. Uh, we don't exactly know what was going on. There's some debate between scholars. Like, did David sin? Is this like him dealing with uh, the fallout of sin in his life? Or is this just more of like a situation like Job, where terrible things happened to him, but he actually wasn't guilty of sin? We just don't know. But ultimately, either way, whether it's David sinning and responding to sin, or whether it's just bad, broken circumstances that he's facing that aren't necessarily his fault, where does he turn to first? He turns to the Lord. His first thought is, I'm turning to the Lord. And he assumes that there could be something in this. There could be like training. It could be under discipline. And basically he says, one of the scholars that I was reading said um, that it says, Essentially, like, stop. Yahweh, stop. I am, stop. So his first thought is to turn to God and be like, stay your hand. I'm weak, Lord. I'm weak. Please don't crush me. So David turns to God. Verse four says, turn, Lord. Rescue me. Save me because of your faithful love. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation before where you feel like, is God angry with me or disinterested? Is he just standing on the sidelines? What is he doing? I think everybody's faced that situation in life. Verse four, in verse four, David says, turn. It's the same word that we might use for a, for a human to repent, like a turn in that way, like a change of mind. He's saying, God, ch change your mind. <laughs> Rescue me. Save me because of your faithful love. Verse five. For there is no remembrance of you in death. Who can thank you in Sheol? Verse six. I am weary from my groaning. With my tears, I dampen my bed. And I drench my couch every single night. So the, the situation that David is facing, 
It's gotten down to the point where he is completely overwhelmed. To the point of, I think in the, I think in the original language it talks about like crying so much that the couch starts to like dissolve. You can imagine what that, what that would require for a couch to dissolve in your tears. Now, obviously there's some hyperbole happening there, but, obviously, but the point is, is very clear. David is pouring out his life, his emotions, everything that he has as he pursues, as he pursues his Lord. Verse seven, my eyes are swollen from grief. They grow old because of all of my enemies. So now a a new thing is introduced, enemies. He hasn't said the word enemies yet until this point. And scholars note that, like, why is he introducing that now? He's just been talking about God, stay your hand, Lord, turn to me. I'm crying, I'm weary, I'm broken, and it's because of my enemies. Just an interesting, just an interesting note. All of a sudden there's this introduction of these new characters. And then verse eight, there's a change, a shift that takes place. Depart from me, all evildoers, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea for help. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed and shake with terror, and they will turn back and suddenly be disgraced. Fascinating. I don't know if anybody finds that to be fascinating. I find that to be fascinating. All of a sudden, at the end of David talking about how broken he is, of him bargaining with God to turn away, to like to stay his hand, he introduces these enemies who are going to be fleeing from terror. <laughs> Just incredible. What is going on here? What's the point? Um, I'm really grateful for a scholar whose name is John Salehammer. He's a professor of Hebrew, and he wrote, if you ever just are looking for one resource to just have on your desk, uh, he wrote a little, I think it's called the NIV Commentary. It's about this thick, and he actually, it's a commentary on the entire Bible, but it's small. You can actually throw it in a backpack, or it doesn't take up a lot of space on a table. And he goes through every single chapter in the whole Bible, and just does like a, ch- a paragraph on each. And I loved reading him for the Psalms over the summer, and I went back and revisited his, uh, his particular commentary. And so here's the thing. This is Psalm 6. There is an order to these Psalms. It's very intentional. And if you remember, Mike preached Psalm 1. I don't remember exactly. I think it was in July. And it was a wonderful message, and it was all about meditating on Scripture as, a, as the way of the righteous person. I don't know if you remember the imagery, but it's sort of like the person who meditates on scripture will be prosperous, fruitful. They'll have God's protection. Um, they'll, be rooted, they'll be rooted in a reality that changes everything. So the central theme of the Psalms is meditation on scripture. But then John Seelhammer says, Psalm 2 qualifies that. So we're in Psalm 6, so we're going to get to that in a second. But I'm just trying to give you the context as we, have, we haven't been in the Psalms. Psalms 2 qualifies that central theme. Yes, the Psalms are about meditating on Scripture, but where do Scriptures ultimately point to? Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is a, messian- is a messianic psalm. And if you don't know the story of David, one of the most important parts of the story of David is that David was a king who was actually promised something extraordinary, something remarkable. God told David, David, I'm going to put somebody on your throne who's going to rule forever. Imagine if you are given a promise by the living God who says, you are going to rule, your family is going to have a descendant who will rule forever. That's a pretty spectacular claim. But that's the, that's the, somebody said once that the problem isn't that I'm going to butcher this, this quote, so actually I might not say it. <laughs> God's promises are big. But the problem isn't that God promises too little, is that he promises too much for us. And so imagine if you're David and God says, I'm going to have a king in your line. One of your children's children's children is going to be on a throne forever. And then within not too long of a time, David's son Absalom is trying to kill him and trying to overthrow his rule. That's what happened to David. David had these incredible promises, but then his family was a mess. Anybody relate to this? <laughs> family life, not the healthiest, but the king is going to come from your line. 
Oh, by the way, you may want to get out of here because your son Absalom's going to whack you. Off with your head. Your serious problems. Serious, serious problems. So by the time we get to Psalm 6, imagine this. You're given promises. Hey, one of your grandkids is going to rule over the universe. Would that, would that do anything for anybody? One of your descendants is going to rule forever, for all time. All of the nations are going to raise their hands to bow down and worship one of your grandkids. Oh, by the way, you got to get out of here. Absalom's seriously going to kill you. It's coming. Man, David knows what it's like to be low. David knows what it's like when the gap between God's promises and our circumstances is enormous. And that's, and it's really hard to know the way through that. But here's the beautiful part about Psalm 6, which is where we are today. David has learned something. David has learned what it looks like when you're in trouble, when he's low, he's learned how to look up. He's not defaulting to his own wisdom, to what he knows, to like how he would ordinarily handle things. Have you ever been in a room before that was completely lit up and the lights went out? Like, what do you think would happen to you? I'm talking like, it's, it's dark, it's light, you can see everything, and then pitch darkness. It's really disorienting. There's a moment where you actually are kind of like temporarily blinded when that happens. What do you think you'd be looking for in that situation? Some sort of light, a flashlight, um, or maybe there's a light somewhere that you can kind of faintly see and you want to make your way through there. In Puerto Rico, where I grew up, this was common. Lights went out all the time. I don't think we realize how good we have it here, that power is like pretty reliable. Uh, when was the last time the power went out here? I guess probably a few months ago. When was the last time before that? Anybody remember? That's like Tuesday in other countries, uh, which is pretty amazing. So anyway, the power, I remember the power would go out. Um, they'd cut it during hurricanes, or it would go out during hurricanes, and it was just like pitch blackness. It was just so hard to see, so disorienting, darkness that seems to con- like envelop. That's where David's at in this psalm. He is in total darkness. In fact, he talks about his eyes. Did you notice that he talks about like my eyes are wasting away in the psalm? It's like he's, it's like he's saying, I can't see anything. I can't see anything. Now imagine if you're in this temporary blindness where you cannot see the way. What do you do? This is what David did. He poured himself out to the Lord. His whole being, his whole person, his whole life. I wish I could tell you that in my life that this is what I've done every time. It's not. It's absolutely not. I've had moments, maybe you've had, I don't know if you've, if you've experienced this, there's a good chance you probably have, but I've had moments in my life where I have literally not been able to sleep because of the anxiety or fear or worry that I'm carrying. Anybody ever been there before? You're trying, you want to sleep and you can't. That's David in this, in this psalm. This is actually called like an evening psalm because he talks about night. So there's like some, some psalms that talk about the morning. Some of them talk about both morning and evening. This one talks about nighttime. This is like a nighttime psalm. This is a companion for those dark nights of the soul. And I wish I could tell you that in my life I've spent, I've, I've mastered this, I haven't. I think part of the reason why I'm even supposed to preach on this is because this is primarily for me and for anybody else who's going through or will go through a night like this. Um, what I tend to do when I go through my dark nights of the soul is I will tend to feel a variety of things. I'll feel angry. I'll feel upset. Um, self-pity is one that I actually feels like a warm blanket sometimes uh, for me. You've been there before. Um, And I'll start to really, without actually saying the words, I'll really start to doubt whether God sees, cares, or knows what I'm going through. Um, There was a time in my life when I was going through something um, where I think it was about six weeks of very little sleep. Not, I was sleeping, but it was the kind of sleep where it was hard to fall asleep, it was hard to stay asleep. Maybe you've been in a spot like that. 
Um, my mind was racing with different thoughts. Um, I was turning and tossing over you know, certain uh, things that I heard, things that were said, things I was feeling, and it was just utter confusion and disorientation. I really felt, I really felt like God was distant, and I really didn't know if I was going to make it out of it. Um, I started to question everything. I started to doubt, like, what am I doing in my life? Am I, am I really a follower of Jesus? I don't know if you've ever like, questioned your own salvation before. Uh, it's not the worst thing in the world. It just depends on where it takes you. And there's actually really healthy times when we can say, like, am I in the faith? The Apostle Paul actually encourages believers to test yourself to make sure you are a Christian. And during the dark night of the soul, um, it can, it's possible sometimes to just begin to doubt, am I really a Christian? Do I really believe do I really believe that God is who he says he is? Because my circumstances and his promises, the gap is just so enormous. In that gap, in that dark night of the soul, something began to happen uh, to me. It took weeks, but I got to the point where I just couldn't handle it anymore. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been in that spot before where it's just sort of like, I can't do this anymore. Um, and, and that's where I got. I'm, I'm so anxious. Uh, there was like a physiological, like, I don't know if you've ever felt like the, the weight on your chest, even just walking around. Anybody ever felt that before? Where it's just like, it's hard to breathe. It feels like my breathing is shallow. There was an anxiety there that was like pretty crushing. And I was stuck in that space until one morning I woke up and I was like, I can't. I can't do this anymore. And I started to pray. And I'm talking, I'm not talking about like, like nice prayers. I'm talking about like ugly prayers, like desperate prayers. I don't know if you've ever been in a spot like that. Um, I started praying. I started talking to God in ways that made me uncomfortable. We're just like, God, I, I need you to show up. I need you, to, I can't. Like if you don't, I'm lost. I need you to come. I need you to begin to change things. And then I did something that began to change the situation, which is I started to actually pray through scripture. If you've never done this before, it's, it's a practice that I can't encourage you enough to, to, to try, which is I picked out a portion of scripture that I was like familiar with that applied to the situation that I was going through and I just started praying it. Like praying it as though my life depended on it. <laughs> praying it as though, God, I don't have the power to make these things so, but you do. And that gap between my circumstances and his promises, I started to fill it with scripture, with the word, with prayer, with dependence. And slowly but surely, it started to go like this. And it started to close. And it started to become the sort of thing where I was like, oh my gosh, I actually believe. God, I believe that you care. I believe that what I'm going through is not a waste. I believe that you're doing something in this. I believe you're changing my life. So what changed? I stopped processing life from within my own resources and started to access the resources of heaven. I started to access the resources of heaven. That's what David's doing in the psalm. He cries out for rescue. He cries out for God to save him. And he does so because verse four says, turn, Lord, rescue me. Save me because look at how faithful I've been to you. He doesn't say that. He didn't say that. He says, save me because of your faithful love which is actually a kind of a, it's not the greatest translation in my mind. Uh, I, I've started this new practice of reading the Bible in Spanish. That Spanish is actually my native tongue, uh, believe it or not. It doesn't feel like that to me, probably doesn't to you either, but that's my first language, is Spanish. And so I've started to read the Bible in Spanish and I'm realizing that reading the Bible in my native tongue, which I didn't do growing up, I never read the Bible as a kid, pretty much never. I started realizing that there are certain words that just mean more to me in my native tongue than in English. Than in English. Faithful love is cool. Amor inagostable. 
See, I'm like forgetting my own language. It's like an inexhaustible love is what it says. Um, if you've ever, uh, man, one of my favorite things to do is to go to places that have uh, soda water in the, the water fountain, in the, uh, not the water fountain, but the, the soda fountain dispenser, because it's just never-ending sparkling water, which I just love. And if they have lemon, it's over. I'm never leaving. But it's this, like, it's unending, this, this water. Unfortunately, with whatever. Soda water is beside the point. Um, Jesus, the Lord, has unending love for us that we just don't know how to access. The Lord has unending love, inexhaustible love for us that we just have no idea how to access. Circumstances, promises, gap. How does that gap close for you? Do you have a way to close that gap? Do you know how it closes in your life? I want to tell you something that I've learned. The terrible circumstances that I've faced in life, which by the way, it's not a competition. You faced your own terrible circumstances. I faced my own. Everybody faces this gap. Some of us go through Everybody goes through something. Everybody in here is struggling with something. There's a gap. How do you close it? David in Psalm 6 teaches us something super important, and I need you guys to hear this. The gap closes when we stop processing life from within our own resources and stop, start practicing, processing life from within his resources. The gap closes when we stop processing life from within our own resources and start processing life from within his resources his inexhaustible love for you. Look at what happened in verse eight. Verse seven, my eye, I'm blind, I can't even see God. The darkness is so thick, I can't find my way through this. Verse eight, get out of here, evildoers. <laughs> Something shifted. Something happened. That process was not a waste. David's suffering was not a waste. And it's interesting, commentators note, what changed? We don't know. Did he see something? Did David actually see something? Did he get a word from the Lord from somebody? Did the circumstances change? He doesn't tell us. He just says, the Lord has heard me. So it's quite possible that David, somehow he knew. He knew that God heard him. He had faith that God heard him and that God was going to stand up. Um, there's so many different things that I, I can touch on and I'm just thinking through. Okay. Um, let's go back to the garden, garden imagery. In the Bible story, you have humans in the garden and they are invited into this amazing relationship with God where they actually get to learn his wisdom. Like Galadriel under the, under the tree, like we were invited, we were created to learn wisdom from God with him. He didn't just leave us on our own to figure out life. He wanted to give us all that we needed. But as you, as you might know, if you don't know the story, I'm going to tell you. When the humans were in the garden with God, Adam and Eve, representatives of humanity, there came a snake, and that snake was a, a, it's a personification of evil that came and whispered lies. It came and whispered lies. And one of my favorite, I'm, I'm reading a, a, we got a new kid's Bible for our kids, and the way that this, that this uh, kid's Bible put it, I loved. When the snake came, the big lie was this, you can figure out what's right and what's wrong yourself. You can figure out what's right and wrong for yourself. In other words, you can process life from within your own resources. You can do what feels right to you. By the way, doesn't that sound like the heartbeat of our culture? Do what feels right to you. You do you. I'm not getting in the way. You do what you want to do. It's that same kind of ancient, ancient lie. And so the, the snake comes in, deceives the humans, 
And now uh, so many, so much of the problems in this world are just like, I do me and you do you and we conflict. <laughs> it's a real problem. And that's, it's, it's sin, it's brokenness, it's messy, all of that. But if, right there in the, in the garden, God makes a promise that's pretty spectacular. He says, I'm gonna send one who is going to crush the head of the serpent. And then all that promise keeps getting clarified and clarified and clarified throughout the course of the whole Bible. And so when God says to David, one is gonna come from you that's gonna rule, that's what he's talking about. He's saying the snake crusher is coming. The snake crusher is coming. And ultimately, what ends up happening one day is that the snake crusher arrives on the scene. His name is Jesus. We're getting ready in a few weeks to celebrate Christmas. It's the arrival of the snake crusher. The dragon slayer has come to cleanse his garden. He's come to cleanse his garden. Did anybody recognize the depart from me, all evildoers? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Who said that? Jesus, Jesus said it. Jesus said it. Um, I think you guys might have in the back Matthew 7, 23. Let's see, you have that? Yes. So this is Jesus. Depart from me, you lawbreakers, or you evildoers. So he's talking. He's talking to ancient Jewish people who are essentially outwardly identified with God, but inwardly were rebellious. They were outwardly identified with God, inwardly rebellious, and he says to them, depart from me, you lawbreakers. Jesus is coming to cleanse his garden. And David, his enemies, it's like, it's like Jesus is in the place of David here, saying, get out. Get out of the garden. All evildoers. But what he did, Jesus, is he came to come, he came to come and cleanse the garden. And part of why I'm mentioning this is because what we lost in the garden with Adam and Eve, we're getting back with Jesus. Uh, David was suffering, apparently, from the, at the hands of people. He was suffering from evildoers. And there's, I know there's many people in this room who have suffered at the hands of people in your life. People who have hurt you, who have let you down, who have disappointed you. I need you to understand something. Jesus is not okay with that. He's not okay with what you've experienced and been through. He's coming. He already came. This is his first coming. He's coming back to finish the job. And so sometimes the, cir- the gap between our circumstances and God's promise, what's, f- what's filling that is just human sin. And I'm letting you know that Jesus has come to deal with that. And when you, you and I learn to process life from within his resources, that gap closes and we will one day See, the, the, we're going to see all of evil put away. We're going to see all of evil cleansed from the garden. So the big question, the big question now is like, what, what have we done with Jesus? Have we received him? Have we embraced him? Um, I had a dream recently that was really interesting. Um, I, you guys might know I'm a big baseball fan. A big Angel fan specifically. And I had a dream that I was actually invited to play for the Angels. I'm almost done. I had a dream that I was actually invited to play for the Angels, but I knew that I wasn't good enough for it. Does that make sense? It was one of those dreams where it was like, it was, it's obviously a dream, but it feels kind of real. Um, I was invited to go to Anaheim and given a uniform. I was given equipment. I was given a bat, cleats, everything. Absolutely everything. But I was invited in the morning, and the game wasn't until nighttime. And in, from the time that I was invited to the time that the game rolled around at night when I had to actually be there, in the dream, like, life got really busy and messy. And there was a lot of things that needed my attention. And the, end, the dream ended with this terrible realization, I'm too late for the game. 
I was living in the dream in South Orange County, which is actually where I lived for years. I lived in Laguna Niguel. And if you know, like South Orange County to Anaheim, there's quite a bit of traffic in between. This dream was weirdly unrealistic and totally realistic <laughs> at the same time. You can't get, it's not like a quick jump from Laguna Niguel to Anaheim. There is travel time. And I came to my senses, like I, I, I realized like, oh my gosh, I've been invited, but I'm too late. I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. And I was wondering about that dream, like, God, what does that mean? What is that dream even about? It feels way too real and on the nose. And kind of terrifying and frightening, all that at the same time. I was invited into a life I could only dream of, but I wasn't ready. And then I started thinking like, Psalm 6. David was invited into this incredible story where it's like, David, your children's children's children will sit on the throne. You have an, a, a royal inheritance. Like, you, you can't even, I can't even find words. There, there are no words to explain like how incredible my promise is to you, David. And I think that what Psalm 6 is is an indication that David knew how to prepare. Like he knew how to prepare in the tough times of life to be ready for his coming king. Because who ultimately saved him? Like who's the one who's rescuing? David, it's God. The Lord has heard my plea for help. The Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has accepted my prayer. So what's my point in saying this? Like I realized in that dream, like I'm not ready for what I've been promised. But there's a life, there's, a, there's like a warning. I felt like it, it was like a warning dream. And Psalm 6 was like the way. Psalm 6 was the way to actually prepare for the life that's to come. We start preparing for the life to come now. In the broken and messy, in the gap between circumstances and promise, we begin to close that gap as we press into Jesus. As we process life from within his resources. As we learn to pray and depend and submit to his ways. As we learn how to meditate on God's word. Ultimately, here's my point. We have to learn what it looks like to wait on Messiah Jesus in this life if we have a desire to be with him in the next. We have to learn how to do that. Jesus is coming to cleanse the garden. Will he find a people who are ready? Because I'm telling you, life will suck, will, will snuff. Life will get in the way. Like that dream that I had, uh, none of the, it's fascinating, none of the things that happened in that dream were sinful. Like none of the things that got in the way were bad. They were all good things. I was just distracted. I was so distracted that I forgot I have been invited to live out my heart's deepest desires but I was disqualified because of how I've handled the gap. I didn't tend to it, I didn't mind it. So I'm gonna invite you to stand up. I'm gonna invite you to consider this. There's like a hundred different ways I could have gone with this message. So it was tough for me to narrow it down because there's so much here. But I want to end with one thing. And we have a, a slide. Could you guys throw up the slide that kind of has like my, my three points? If you're a note taker, I probably should have had you write this down before you stood up. That's fine. It's actually really easy to memorize. Psalm 6 teaches us that in our distress, like he sees, he knows, he sees, and he cares. And I don't believe that we're actually going to be the kind of people who learn to turn to him unless we believe that he cares, that he's loving, and that his love for you is inexhaustible. One day I'll, I'll remember what the word in Spanish is like, inagotable. Agotar is to like run out. It never runs out. So I think Psalm 6 is teaching us don't give up. Persevere in prayer to the very, very end. And what we know and what we see through the rest of scripture is that this is exactly what Jesus did. 
for us. Jesus, the one who was promised, I don't know if you remember this, if you're not familiar with the story in the garden, he was in agony. It was his dark night of the soul. And he felt like he was overwhelmed to the point of death in darkness. And what he did is he fulfilled Psalm 6. He pressed into God. He did not let go. And he entrusted himself fully to God. But here's the crazy part. Jesus died. God's will was for him to die. Why? So that you could live. So that the promise to David would actually come true. So that he could rise from the dead and now he's enthroned. He's enthroned. And he's going to clear out his garden. He's going to cleanse it. And you're invited to be a part of it. Will you be ready? Will we be ready to live in between the circumstance and the promise and learn how to close that gap together? Let's pray. Jesus, I want to thank you. Um, I want to thank you that you that you died so that we could live. You died to secure a place for us in your family. And I thank you that the reality is that that's something we have to prepare for. That's not something we coast to. It's through many hardships and tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of heaven where the king is reigning. It's not an easy life. But what makes it hard is that we have ways that where we are comfortable. Like we know how to kind of process life from within our own resources. We know how to make things happen or how to stay out of trouble or whatever or how to find like what our heart is looking for. In all these different ways, there's a way that seems right, but it leads to death. But I thank you that we have access to the resources of heaven through prayer and perseverance. Ultimately, you, Jesus, are the one who prayed and persevered to the very end. And you died so that we could live. Now I pray, Jesus, that we as a church would be conformed to your image, that we would become like you, that we become the kind of people who suffer when life gets hard. We agonize, but we don't let go of you. We don't let go of your promises. We don't give up, but we hold on until we can say, evil be gone. Jesus is coming. Jesus is here, and he will rule and reign, and I will reign with him. Lord, would you make us a people who are ready for you? ready for your return? Would we not be the kind of people like me in my dream who are fans, but we're not fit to play? Lord Jesus, may we never just be your fans. May this never turn into like a fan club of Jesus, but would we actually pursue fitness in the fire of suffering? would we actually be disciplined and trained by it? Even if we have to say, God, stay your hand, this is too much. Even that is trust. Even that is faith. And if that's all we have today, God, then may may we be the most faithful people at just saying, please, God, stop. Please come and rescue me. This is too much for me. Save me. Your love is inexhaustible, just like David did. And would we persevere to the point where we can say, along with David, God has heard me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that on the cross you died. And in a sense, there was silence to your, to your prayers so that God could hear our prayers. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we would never be forsaken. Thank you that you suffered everything for us. Thank you that all the things that I'm talking about, you've already done for us, and that now you want to do it through us. Would you strengthen us and make us the kind of people who endure to the end, no matter what we face? And would we be a kind of community that help each other to actually endure? God, we love you and we thank you. In your name, amen. Tell me how you close. How have you come up? Thank you, bro. Thank you so much, JB. So much wisdom there. Um, okay, we're going to, I want to set up some ministry time.
feel like God's doing some things in the room and I want to honor what he wants to do. Um, and so, faithful love equals inexhaustible love. I love that. Really, really powerful. Um, Herrick talked about this gap, okay? He talked about this gap from God's promises being experienced in your life, and then it's the circumstances that you're living in, kind of the, the, these two things aren't aligned. And I get this overwhelming sense that there's some of us in the room that you're like, okay, but like how? Like, how do I do this? Here's how David did this in the scriptures. Herrick gave you the, these, these, um, these beautiful truths up here, but there's this reality of David kept fixing his eyes on God. And so I I don't know what you're facing today in your life or this week in your life. Maybe you're, maybe you're doing fantastic. Maybe life is flawless. Maybe you're just flying. You're soaring. It's great. It's awesome. Praise God, okay? But if for whatever reason you're not, if for whatever reason the circumstances that you're facing are causing you to be uneasy, even in the slightest, I think God has something for you. And I think the only way for you to actually receive that is to not keep trucking, it's not to keep motoring, it's not to try to do things in your own strength and just push through it. It's to fix your eyes on him. So here's what I want to do. Um, I want you to close your eyes, not to be overly spiritual, but I want you to focus right now and I want everybody's hands out in front of them in the room. If you need to set something down, set something down. We're doing this, again, not to be overly spiritual. We're doing this because we're spiritual beings as much as we're physical beings, and I'm convinced there are many of us in the room who need to receive. So this holding your hands out is just a posture of, I I need you. I need to receive you. It's an act of faith. What faith is, is it's trusting him. It's trusting him. And that requires action. So when you, when you hold your hands out, it's like, God, I'm coming to you because I need you and I believe that you have something to offer me. So as much as you can in this moment, I want to invite you to connect those dots in your heart and your mind. I'm holding my hands out because I, I'm in need and I believe that you can help And David models this for us. He brings his burdens to the Lord. And he, because he's looking to him, he's reminded of the truth about God. And what did that do? It ignites his faith. And you see that shift that takes place in the psalm. Some of you in this room, you need that shift today. And the way that you're going to get it is by fixing your eyes on the truth of God and receiving that as truth. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to give you truth. God will never leave you or forsake you. No matter how bad it gets, he'll never abandon you. Your sins, he separated them from you as far as the east is from the west. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And you were created for good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. That means you have so much purpose that your maker, your maker designed you with a purpose to love the world radically. That means you matter. You There's something on that, Lord. You matter. Hear me in the deepest part of your spirit, not because some goofy guy like me with a microphone says so, but because God Almighty through his word says you matter. God was willing and glad to give his body and his blood so that you would be free from trying to earn your salvation, earn your freedom, earn the approval of other people. In Christ Jesus, you are fully affirmed of by God Almighty. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would minister to our hearts for the rest of this morning. 
that you would help us as we, as, we, as we posture our heart to receive the truth of your word in the deepest parts of our being, that you would ignite our faith like you did, David. And it would provide salvation. It would provide freedom. And it would provide joy. Would you meet with us now as we respond? Um, if you're on the prayer team, would you begin to make your way over off to the side of the room, please? That would be wonderful. For some of you, there's things in your life right now that you're like, ah, I feel really uneasy. I need some care from the Spirit. There's trusted men and women who are making themselves available right now to pray over you. Please don't leave without receiving that. It's a gift from God. He wants to meet with you. He wants to minister to you. Some of you... The, 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 the prescription that you need for this morning is your soul needs to cry out in praise to the Lord. Your soul needs to like, needs to declare the truth of God back to him. Like Herrick talked about, I just, I'm praying the scripture, I'm praying the word back to God. Some of you need to do that right now through song. Like you're, you're, again, you're just as much of a, of a physical being as you are a spiritual being. Some of you need to like have those two things come into alignment by bringing, by delivering God the praise that he's due for his goodness and his kindness and his love and his mercy and his holiness. There's nobody like him. He's so worthy. He's been so kind to you. And sometimes, like Herrick talks about, the circumstances of our life, they numb us the pain in our life, the suffering in our life, the uneasiness in our life, it numbs us to the goodness and to the glory of God. So can I just, can I just request of you this morning that you wouldn't just go through the motions, that you actually bring God your heart. Bring him your praise. Receive, some of you need to receive. Go receive prayer. Let someone minister to you. Why? Because you matter to Almighty God. And let him matter to us this morning, okay? Would you guys minister to us? Feel empowered. You can go over and receive prayer whenever you want. You can sit. You can stand. This is a moment for us to respond to the goodness and the glory and the grace and the mercy and the love of God. Enjoy him, and I'll be up in a bit to close us, okay?
Please, we come up. Uh, there's some people that God wants to uh, wants to minister to. Yeah, as we were singing, um, I keep getting a picture of like a woman holding her purse, and it's like you're digging through it, looking for something that you can't find. Um, but it's truly it hasn't been opened in so long that you really just need to pour it all out and start over. Um, it feels like a metaphor for um, your heart. I'd love to pray for you. One of the things, whenever we gather, we don't want to control the environment. We want to be open, a posture of openness. God, what do you want to do? He's not absent. He's not passive. He's active. His spirit is, 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 is in his people, and he desires to care for us. He's worthy of our worship, and he desires to care for us. He's a father, right? And so if what Lisa is sharing, if I think that's God highlighting a woman in this room because he wants, to, he wants to love you. He wants you to experience his love in a personalized way that ignites your faith and frees you. So if that's you, before you go, Lisa will be over here. Let her pray for you. JB. Um, as I was, as we were praying, I just had a thought. Um, I think... It's really simple. Um, it's, it's this. It's that it's in, in the hard that we learn to hope. It's in the hard stuff that we learn to hope. Um, this is, I think, a part of it's just for you young people to have something to write down in your sheet so you remember. It's like, what was that message about? Cleats and soda water and elves. I don't know. Um, it's in the hard stuff that we learn to hope. And I think that is like, that's the promise that's in front of us uh, as a community. Is that this, nothing's wasted yeah. if we learn to press in when we're suffering. Yeah. There's no waste. Yeah, you have no reason to, to hold on to hope if everything's just perfect all around you. That's, that's coming for us. The day is coming. No pain, no suffering, no death, no tears. The way things are supposed to be, that's coming. It, it's, it's, it's peeking through the clouds right now. We get to experience it partly in the present, fully in the future, though. And so here's what I feel like God wants for us. I think he wants to strengthen some of us in the room right now. And we're going to be strengthened by remembering the Lord. When you're faced with the challenges of the day, of the week, of the month, of the year, of the last three years, let's be honest. We have a decision to make when we're faced with those things. And the decision that we have in front of us is, are we going to remember the truth about God or are we going to let our circumstances be the Lord of our life? God says, choose you this day who you will serve, who will be your Lord. And I can't help but feel like there's this, there's this burden on my spirit this morning that some of us were being lorded over by our circumstances. We're not receiving that which God has paid so dearly for. He's given his body and his blood so that we'd be free from that, so that we can have a peace and a security and a joy that transcends our circumstances. And when we're faced with terrible circumstances or hard circumstances or uncomfortable circumstances, we have the opportunity and we're empowered by his spirit to remember what's true and keep it, keep at it, fan that flame, tend to it, throw another log on the fire, grab a brother or a sister and go, I need you to tell me, remind me what's true about me in Christ. Remind me what's true about, about who God is and what he's done so that that flame doesn't die out. I think I'm gonna preach on that next week. Let me pray for us before we close. Um, yeah, let me pray for us.
Father, thank you that you're always available to us. Thank you that uh, that we're not like. Um, thank you that what happens to us is not random. Thank you that your sovereign grace is ruling over everything. And like a father, you are raising us up spiritually. You're, you're, you're developing us, our character, our integrity, the unseen things inside of us, the, 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 the us that we really are. And thank you that you don't, um, you don't leave any, any stone unturned. You desire our whole heart. There's nobody like you, Jesus. You're so wonderful. You're so merciful. You're so kind. You're so faithful to us. A love that never runs out. That dare we say is actually, it seems kind of reckless. Like you just don't stop. It's the well that never runs dry. Jesus, you are faithful to us. I pray that, that these truths of who you are would like actually sink into the deepest parts of our soul this morning. Like not later, like right now. We'd soak up the truth of your word, what you declare. You determine what is true. Our feelings don't determine what is true. Our culture doesn't dis- determine what is true. Only you, Jesus. You're the king. You're the Lord. We desire your kingdom, your rule, your reign, your way. So would you help us, Holy Spirit? Point us to Jesus this week. Help us to remember the truth of who you are in such a way that, such a way that brings freedom. You're wonderful. You're wonderful, Jesus. We pray these things in your holy and beautiful name and all God's people said, amen. All right, guys, there's a few minutes left until you need to pick up your kids. Um, there's still, uh, looks, how we got more? Yes, yeah. Hey guys, last thing. Um, prayer team will be available like for a while over here. I just feel like God put it on my heart that today uh, to ask for healing. Um, physical healing so um, especially thinking about that gap of God's promise that he will redeem us um, we want to ask our good father so um, if you have any pain um, please come and get prayer we'll be here long after so just come find us yeah if you're suffering in any way um, maybe just maybe God wants to do something miraculous in your body to demonstrate his power and his authority and for you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's the Lord. His kindness transcends whether, whether it happens today or not, but we know the day is coming when it, when it will. We'll all be, it will experience the fullness of healing, but we don't stop pressing into the kingdom of God in the meantime. All right. Love you guys very much. Receive prayer if you'd like to. And then at noon, if, if you would, make sure you pick up your kids. Hope you enjoy your Sunday. Know that you're loved.